All right, Deuteronomy chapter 6, picking up there in verse 10. Remember the first part of it? He dwelt a lot on teaching the children, knowing that law, passing that law on to the children. Let's read now Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 down through 15, please. Who will grab that for us? Deuteronomy 6, 10 to 15. Just... So it shall be, when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full, full of all good things which you did not build, even out of wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, when you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him, and shall take oaths in His name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Okay. So essentially, what's he saying here? Okay, remember who gave you all this. Don't forget God. Because forgetting God will bring trouble to you when you get into that land and things are going well. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But in verse 13, you've got, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him. Does that sound familiar? You may have a footnote that tells you where that's quoted. Anybody take a guess at it or see your footnote and like, oh yeah, I remember that now. Matthew 14. Matthew 14, what's going on? Matthew chapter 4. The temptation of Jesus by saying he's fasting. Exactly. Exactly. And this is one of the times where Christ was tempted. Uh, and he tells him, you know, fear the Lord your God, serve him. The devil wanted Jesus to bow down to him. And he said, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And the Lord quotes here from Deuteronomy 6.13 that you should serve, worship, fear God and God alone. So he quoted from this passage, as we said last week, I believe it was we mentioned it, all three times that Jesus was tempted, He answered, of course, with Scripture, but He answered with Scripture out of the book of Deuteronomy. 6.13 is one of those. Let's read now verses 16 through 19, and notice what He says here. Deuteronomy 6.16 through 19. Philip. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted Him in Massa. You shall diligently, diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God his testimonies and his statutes which he commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you. And that you may go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to cast out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. Okay. So, verse 16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. How about that? Alright, Matthew 4, verse 7. When Satan tried to get the Lord to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple, and the Lord responded, well, you're not to tempt the Lord your God. You, you don't test Him. You don't provoke Him. You don't challenge Him. Do you really love me or not? So you don't tempt the Lord your God in that way. So don't make God your enemy, as he goes on to talk about there. And I ask in question number six in this lesson, Consider how the principle of 619 applies to us. Note your thoughts and list some enemies that we face. So what's the principle here? What's the thing he's driving at with the people of Israel? What they can expect from God? What does he tell them he's going to do? Okay, they need to do what is right and good. In verse 19, what's the commitment he makes to them? 
Cast out all your enemies. You go in, you cast out the enemies because the Lord's going to be with you. So how does that apply to us? To have faith that He will do that for us. Okay. What, what kind of enemies do we have? What's the most obvious that we... Literally, it means adversary. Satan. Satan. Satan is our enemy. He... He is the enemy of God's children and really of all mankind. Um, he is seeking to destroy us. But with God, we can overcome Him. God has said, I can drive Him out of your life. I can keep Him away from you. But what do we have to do? We have to submit to the Lord. Exactly. Are there any other enemies we have? How okay, I'm gonna give you one. How about apathy? If we become apathetic about serving God, about doing his will, worshiping God, studying the word, things like that, that in a sense is our enemy. We have to fight against that. What other kinds of things? And really when we're talking about enemies, we're talking about sin. Any type of sin. Okay? Um, sometimes we run into problems in our social circles or at work or even among family where people are pushing us. Maybe it is that they're ridiculing us or making fun of us or insulting us or condemning us for being servants of God or they're trying to lure us into sin. In that case, those people are an instrument of the devil and acting as our enemy. But we can overcome these things and we can drive them out, so to speak, as we turn to the Lord, as we trust in Him, as we remember Him, like the Israelites are being admonished to do in this section. You need to remember God and He'll be with you to help you as you go in to drive out those enemies. Any other thoughts there? Alright, let's read 20 through 25, please, and we'll wrap up chapter 6 here. Deuteronomy 6, 20-25. Who will get that? Talk. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded you? Then you should say to your son, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and, to the, Lord, and the Lord brought us from Egypt with a mighty hand. Moreover, the Lord showed us great and distressing signs and wonders before our, eyes, before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land which he has sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. It will be righteous it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all His commandment before the Lord our God, just as He commanded us. Okay, so He brings up a scenario that He says this is going to happen in the future. Verse 20, when your son asks you what? The child's going to grow up, come to the point of curiosity about the way things are. What does all this mean? Okay. And specifically what? Um, have any young people ever asked why do we have to do this? What? Why do we have to go to church? Why do we have to study the Bible? Why do we have to pray? Why do I have to go to the Bible classes? Right? That's kind of like what he's saying here. You know, they're going to ask you, why do we have all these things? Why, why do we have to go to these feasts every year? Why do we have to um, not do any work on the Sabbath? What, what's this all about? And what's the response that they are to give their children? Remind what the Lord did for them. Hey! What were they before? Slaves. 
slaves in the land of Egypt, misery, suffering, oppressed. But God brought us out. And He gave us this law. And the idea is that living under this law is a blessing and a benefit to us. We're no longer slaves in misery. But now we're under this law that makes us a people, gives us a relationship with God. It blesses us. And so what, of course, would the parallel be for us? What would the connection be, the application? We have a past life when we were in sin, and now we have a new life, and through God's guidance and God's Word, we can go forward and we follow after what He tells us in the Word. It's following His will, seeking His will to follow. Right, we have a past life where we're in sin. And what about these children? What about our children? What about the next generation? And asking questions of us. Why do we partake of you know, a cracker and juice on Sunday? Children will ask those kinds of things. Why, why, do, why do you give money on Sunday? Why, why do we get up and go to church Sunday morning and why do we go on Wednesday night? I mean, all my friends are doing other stuff on Wednesday night. Why do we do that? Are we prepared to answer? He's telling these people here, you, you need to be ready to answer and explain to your children why we do these things and to remind them of God's goodness and God's mercy and how He's brought us into this relationship with Him. Explain to them, it's a blessing. We need to explain to our children you know, being a part of a congregation, being a part of God's people, that's a blessing. Living under the gospel of Christ is a blessing. It's not a burden. It's not oppressive. It is free you know, We're free in Christ. We're not slaves of sin any longer. We're not under Satan. But we are living for the Lord and we're blessed to have this relationship with Him. Any other thoughts there? Yes. I think it's very important that we get to our young children or young people that uh, when they say, why do we have to? Well, we don't have to. But it's a choice that we make because we know that we need to be and want to be right. Right. Mike. To your point, we don't have to get to. That's we, we get to. Uh, I'm going to turn it just slightly. Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the Gospel. He was saying, I have to preach the Gospel. From that standpoint, I know exactly what you're saying, Bonnie, but from that standpoint, I don't have any choice. Not because God is making me do it. It's because God is allowing me to do it. Because God has been so good to me, I am compelled from within to do these things. And if we don't have that inner drive to serve God, somewhere along the way we're going to find an excuse or reason, we're going to rationalize why we don't need to do it. Why we don't need to be at Wednesday night class. Why we don't have to show up for Sunday morning. Why we can just go now and again. or Why... Um, it doesn't really matter about studying the Bible or praying. So we need to have that inner drive. And to Bonnie's point, we need to explain to them, hey, this is a great blessing. This is a great privilege. Um, if you've ever been without something and then you enjoy that, say somebody who... Um, somebody who grows up in great poverty and then they get to a point in their life that they have things, they have a deeper appreciation for it and they take care of those things better than someone who's had it handed to them all their life. And it's sort of like that. We were in spiritual poverty and now we're in spiritual riches. We, we need it, that second, that third generation as he's pointing to here, you need to ground them in understanding or looking at this properly 
because they can end up taking it for granted. And we know when you get into the book of Judges, that's exactly what they do. They end up taking it for granted. But Just a thought in verses 24 and 25 mm -hmm. it kind of applies to what you're saying. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes. Fear the Lord our God for our good always, that He might preserve us alive and His dead. So, it's for our good, but it is commanded. You know, it is a blessing for us, but it is commanded. So. Yeah, for our good always. God's commands are for good. They're a benefit. They're a blessing. Any other thoughts there? All right, let's jump into chapter 7. Let's read 1 through 5 here. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 5. Who will read that for us? Charles. The Lord of God brings you into the land which you go to possess and cast out many nations before you the Ai, the Germicides, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Barisites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, even seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivered them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them or no worship to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take your daughters for your son. For they will turn your son away from the following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be about to get you and destroy you suddenly. But thus you shall deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their sacred pillars and cut down their wood images and burn their carved images with fire. Okay, so the entire chapter dealing with them going into the land of Canaan, conquering the land, destroying idolatry here. This in particular is talking about that idolatry. He opens it up by listing these various nations there. He says seven nations, and what was the condition of the nations relative to Israel? They're greater and mightier than Israel. Um, maybe greater in number, but remember that they also had fortified cities that had walls around their cities. Um, they were probably more used to warfare than the Israelites were because, you know, they were slaves. They came out of the land of Egypt. Uh, now they've had some battles, you know, on the east side of Jordan, but that's not their long history. They're not a warrior nation. Philip. There are also giants in the land, so they were much larger than the Israel. Exactly. Exactly right. And another factor that's not necessarily direct to this, but you know, that's their home. They're going in and invading somebody else's home. Uh, but they're greater and mightier. You know, if you look at it as a man looks at it. Israel shouldn't be able to go in and conquer this whole territory. But they are going to be able to because God was working with Israel. He was there to help them as they go to conquer that land and the people of that land. And what does He tell them to do in verse 2? Utterly destroy them. Utterly destroy them. What are they not to do? What's that? Yeah, don't don't make any covenant with them. Don't make a covenant and don't show them mercy. Um, why are these nations, why is God letting Israel go in and conquer this territory and kill these people? Well, it's their judgment. Okay, it's their judgment. Their judgment. Philip? Exactly. If you go all the way back to Genesis 15, 16, uh, the Lord told Abraham there that their iniquity is not yet full. 
Well, now their iniquity is full. It's time for judgment on the inhabitants of the land of Canaan. So that's why he's allowing them to go in. They're to go in and get rid of the sin that is there in that land. Um, and he says you, you can't make a covenant. You can't make peace. You can't have terms of peace with him. What about our enemy? Can we make a covenant of peace? Does He want us to make a covenant of peace? Yeah. What, what about the ones that He animates? Does anybody know what I mean by that? The ones that He's making look like they're really pleasures by following them. Or okay. It, you know, it appeals to the lustful side of the body. Okay. They're... There is the idea of the immorality that is out there that he wants us to make peace with, comes to terms with, and our culture is certainly putting the pressure on us to do that, to come to terms and, and make peace with all forms of things, the transgenderism and all that kind of stuff that's going on these days. Um, so they want us to be quiet. Of course, that's the, that's the first thing they want, is us to be quiet, but then what do they want? Look at the denomination. They want us to say that everybody's okay. All you have to do is leave, say the prayer, and it's all right. If you fall into that, then you're, you're just you're good. Right. Come on. There you go. From, and being quiet and it's tolerated to full acceptance on it. And so they understand just as we should understand that changing of the inside means something. Because if you change the inside, the outside changes as well. And so, you know, if you're quiet about it, you don't say anything, you know it's just a small skip to you're going to accept it. Mm -hmm. Bill? Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, there is that step yeah. even beyond that they want us to promote it, to openly, actively endorse it. Not just to be quiet, not just to say, hey, you can come and be a part of it here, but openly say, it's good, it's alright, there's nothing wrong with these things. But that's that's been true going all the way back. Uh, that, that's one of the ways Satan works is he chips away and keeps pushing that and he wants us to come to terms of peace along the way. That's true with the immorality and as Hank brought up, that's true with false religion and the denominations. They want us to be at peace. They want us to all kind of be together, approve of each other and, and don't, you know, don't condemn anybody. Don't, don't make an issue of it. You know, why argue about all those things? Because you know, we all love Jesus. The, the, uh, um, the mantra in our society with the moral issues now is love is love. Right? Love is love. Well, why are you against love? Well, I'm not against love. You know, but they, they twist it that way and that's how denominations do. They'll twist it. Well, somehow the person who stands in the truth and speaks the truth is the bad person so the pressure will come to make peace. Um, just as the Israelites, there would be pressure to make peace, to, to come to terms. And he's saying, don't do that. You can't compromise on those things. You have to stand strong and press forward with what the Lord has told you to do. Uh, there are some things that God requires of us that are difficult to do. They're difficult. But we have to be committed to doing them. Otherwise, we have failed Him in our relationship to Him. Any other thoughts there? Reminded of what Paul wrote to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 about the man who had his father's wife. He basically says, you doing nothing about it is the same as you accepting it. So, were they openly promoting and endorsing it? Probably not, but maybe the text, at least from memory right now, doesn't. Uh, I don't 
to correct that, which he said you might as well fully accept. It. So that's true of other things too. If you do nothing, inaction is is just as bad sometimes. Right, Mike. You probably want to wrap this up, but you know, whenever you, whenever you see what um, he tells them to do, um, specifically with the marriage, just stay away from them. And then when he tells them to tear down every one of their high places, their altars, so obviously there's going to be a lot in there. I mean, that seems to be a big problem that they're going to have if God wants it gone. And um, as, they, as we kind of see that happening, what we see is they don't tear down every single high place and they don't you know and it's just those couple that kind of stay out there but it's just enough leavening to leaven the whole lot. okay and that gets us to exactly question one why were they to destroy the idolatry in the land of canaan it was in part to keep them from being corrupted by it don't allow that to be around you because it's it's going to affect you sooner or later so it'll pull people away and so, as has been mentioned, you know, he goes on to talk about don't get mixed up in these marriages. Now, he's not saying that if somebody in the land or somebody somewhere believes in Jehovah God who will accept that covenant, that you can't do anything and marry them. You know, Ruth the Moabitess and things like that. But he's saying these idolaters here, you cannot get mixed up with them. Joe? Yeah, I mean, look at Solomon. Right. I mean, you can talk to it, you know. Right. Exactly. And that's what Nehemiah later says when some of the people in his time were involved in these mixed marriages. He says, look at Solomon. He couldn't handle it. What makes you think you can? You can. And now, the pulpit commentary made a note of this, that what God is laying out for them here is a policy of separation. They were to be a separate people. It's a policy of also of a religious intolerance. You know, people get angry when they see someone who is intolerant. We are supposed to be intolerant people. We love people. We want people to obey the gospel and to serve God and to go to heaven. But we need to be intolerant when it comes to sin. And that's what he is laying out for them here. All right, any other thoughts down through five? Mark. I was going to point out also, and I think it also has the purpose of saying, I am God. These are not gods at all. And uh, so I think it serves the purpose of bringing honor to His name as well. Right. When, when you accept the concept, the idea, and the reality that Jehovah is God, all the rest of this falls into place. It all makes sense. Because if He's God, that means all the rest of these things are false gods and they're bad and we need to get rid of them. Good point. Alright, let's read verses 6 through 11 then. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 11. Who will grab that for us? For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set His love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which He swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore, the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and His loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love Him and keep His commandments, but repays those who hate Him to their faces to destroy them. He will not delay with Him who hates Him, He will repay Him to His face. Therefore you shall keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do. Okay, so I had asked in question two, what do we learn about God's character and nature and how does that apply to us in these verses here? Loving, true, and faithful. Loving, true, and faithful? As far as applying to us, we should be able to 
have that faith in God that he will do what he says. Okay, have that faith he'll do what he says because he does love us. Any other thoughts there? Tom? Well, just as he chose Israel, it wasn't based on anyone's merit. He's chosen us, not based on anything we've done, but because he's chosen us. And we should understand that, be appreciative of that, and follow him. <laughs> Yeah, be humbled by it. Titus chapter 3 talks about not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by His grace acting it. Joe? I think that later on, I think He changes that about the 34th generation. He just said that, I think it's in Ezekiel somewhere, He said that the person, the man is accountable to his own, to his own self. He's no longer going to go for the children. Well, and all along, it, he's, he's not saying... You know, if your son goes into sin, I'm just going to ignore that for three and four generations. What he's saying is, I will continue to work with these people to try to um, bless them, help them in serving me, and to experience the good blessings that I have for them. But there comes a time where he he cuts off a nation. He's he says, I'm done, as he goes on to talk about here. But you've got the love of God expressed here but also the severity of God is explained as well. What does he say on the severe side there? Repays those who hate Him to their face. To Repays them, those who hate Him, to their face. What do you get out of that? <laughs> he ain't playing around. Joe? It says he visits the iniquity of the fathers on the second, third, and fourth generation. So, I mean, is that not kind of like he's saying that he is paying that sin all the way through the fourth, and third, fourth generation? They're, they're not guilty of it, but to, to get back to that point, what he's saying in those things is people who commit sin, it's going to affect their children, their grandchildren, and so on. He's not going to prevent it from bringing problems in their lives. It's, it's not the sin transfers. It's not that He's punishing one generation for another generation's sin. Philip? More consequences of the sin. Right. 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 In small towns, you build up a name for yourself, you lose that name in a small town, and that name's lost for generations. Exactly. Mike? Well, when you look at divorce today, and the consequences of that goes through many generations before you, know, you can start to really understand the, the uh, impact of that. And um, you know, so I think it's important that we understand that our sins can cause, uh, the consequences can be carried on down to our children. And, um, we see that in today's society, and you know, we, we live in a society that not too long ago, where the divorce rate was not as high as it is now, and now it's you know up to fifty percent. We continue to see all these problems that are continuing on. It's just one generation after another generation that gets worse and worse. It continues to decay out. Right, and the, with the plague of divorce, what? we're seeing happening now is there's a lot that just don't get married. They just live together so they don't have to go through that divorce. In their mind they think, well that's that's a better way of handling this, which it's not. But that has its own set of consequences. Yeah, and you know, those people can still choose to do the right thing. Yes. But because of all these past generations doing the wrong thing, it continues to perpetuate itself. Right. Paul? Yeah, you would tell on verse 2 about how that applies to that. We are not on verse 2. We're on question 2. Question 2, yeah. All right. No, no. No, I just thought we were backing up. <laughs> uh, uh, you, how does that apply to us? Well, you know, we, we have the Lord's Supper. <laughs> and that's one of those things that we do on the first day of the week. We apply that to our life every week. If we did it every fifth Sunday, or like some of the rest of them try to do, you know, we, we forget 
to forget. And, and he's trying to get them to remember. Do these things so you won't forget. Yeah. Be mindful of God always. And He's built in things into the Gospel that help us to be mindful of Him and His love and the sacrifice. Now, back to this idea about His severity repaying Him, repaying those who hate Him to their face. Anybody want to comment on that? Um... God will get in your face. God will get all over you. Right? The, the principle in Galatians chapter 6 is you reap what you sow. There's no getting around that. There's no getting around God becoming your enemy because you have turned away from Him. And He's not going to, as Rick said, play around. It's not going to mess around. When you come up against God, there are some hard consequences that you have to deal with. And so He will repay those who hate Him to their face. Any other thoughts there? Philip? What you did to Israel when they fell away was not so. Even, even during the judge period, they were, I mean, there was that uh, cycle that when they fell away, he wasn't subtle about it. And each time they fell away, the punishment got more severe and more severe. So we definitely did that. Right, right, exactly. Good, good point on that. All right, let's read verses 12 through 16, please. Deuteronomy 7, verses 12 to 16. Go grab that. Philip? Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments, which he can do, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your land and the fruit of your land, your grain and your new wine and your oil, and increase the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you from all sickness. And He will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them on all those who hate you. Also, you shall destroy all people whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eyes shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods. That will be a snare to you. Okay. So there's a blessing here that he's saying to the obedient, to the faithful, that you'll have plenty of fruit, fruit of the womb, fruit of the land, the grain, the new wine, the flocks, all those things. Um, why might he be emphasizing this in a chapter where he says, go in and destroy all the idolatry? What was the claim of idolatry? Yeah, a lot of them, fertility. And if you will worship this idol, you'll have good crops. You worship this idol, then you'll have plenty of flocks. If you worship this idol, then you'll have babies. So there's idols for all these things and the Lord is making a very simple point here. You don't need them. Rick, do you have something? I was just going to say what you said is basically all of those idols were gods of different things. So they each have their own blessing. Right. And here's Jehovah God, the one God through whom all these blessings flow. So serve Him and all these things are going to be all right. You know, the Lord says the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, worship God, all these things will be added to you. It, he'll take care of you. He'll see that your needs are met. So don't worry about all of that. You don't need to turn these worldly ways and worldly solutions. Serve God. 
and you'll be all right. He'll look out for you. Any other thoughts there? All right, so question three I ask, what stands out in verse 16? Also you shall destroy all the peoples from the Lord, uh, whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eye shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. Anything stand out to you there? You can't be compassionate about their lifestyle. Can't be compassionate about their lifestyle. The, the no pity was a thing that really stood out to him because if you have pity on them, you're going to feel sorry for them. You're going to Oh, well, let's let it go. Well, just like today, you see everybody wants to be soft about everything because you're going to have to feel sorry for somebody because they're in sin. Well, that's not what we're doing. We're not going to feel sorry and have pity on them. We're going to love them enough to try to get them out of That would be the way to do Instead of having pity on them and not having them. Okay. Hey. As, we, as we read this, we think that's such a simple thing to destroy someone and not not feel empty. Yeah, we we can read it in a sterile thing, just like you can you can read about war, about combat. But if you've not been in war, you've not been in combat, you don't know what the emotions are like there. Right? It's, that's, that's why many who come back from combat have emotional struggles because of what they see. We can read about it, but we don't have those emotional struggles when we read about it. But you, can you imagine utterly destroying... I mean, that's like going into an entry, killing everybody in this town. Mm-hmm. And walking out and eating dinner. Yeah. That's what that's what we don't grasp that. That's the commitment they had to have. And we wonder why they sometimes fail. Right. As we said before, this was a difficult task they had before them, but it's one they had to do. And if we if we apply it to today, um we cannot have pity on error. We cannot have pity on false teachers. People who are pushing error and unrighteousness. We, we have to have the strength to resolve that when we strike, we strike hard. And regardless of the reaction, we make sure we stick to it. Because if we start having pity, we start feeling sorry for people who are stubborn in their air, we're going to end up compromising and backing off and backing up. And we cannot do that. Now, does that mean we understand that what he's telling Israel here, that this was a national thing as well as a religious thing. And we're not in the business of just going out and crushing people, right? We, we want to save souls and we don't want to be arrogant when we confront error. But we also don't want to be apologetic for exposing error, for bringing it to light. Because some people get upset, some people cry, some people get very angry and vicious. Well, we, that shouldn't affect us. We, we should speak the truth, speak it plainly, and press forward. Any other thoughts there? Alright. Um... I did not plan on reading 17 to 26. He just kind of goes through there and says, don't have fear of these other nations. Remember what I did in Egypt and I will continue to be with you. And anybody who escapes you, I'm going to send hornets into the land and drive them out. So if they remain committed, God will be with, with, with them and working with them. And he said, be sure you destroy the idols. Don't cover the silver, the gold, or anything like that. Because if you do, it's going to be a snare to you. Now, chapter 8. A couple of things I want to grab here. Um, in chapter 8, let's read verses 2 through 5, please. We'll read Deuteronomy. Mike. You shall remember all the way which your Lord, your God, have led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that He might humble you, testing you 
to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, with which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out of you, nor did your foot swell these forty years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God will discipline you as a man disciplines his son. All right. So question four I'd ask, what did God do with Israel and why? And what's the lesson for us? He put them to test. He put them to trials. He put things in front of them to harden them to the warriors that they needed to be. And also so that they would learn reliance upon them. Okay. Any other thoughts there? Yeah, he's... he's Paul? Hey. He told them to, to believe in Him and trust Him. And all their, all their food came from Him. Right, right. And, of course, 8 verse 3 is where the other place that the Lord cites, quotes, when He's faced, faced with the temptation from the devil to turn these stones into bread. You know, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But he's testing them in the wilderness, putting them through these trials so that they have their focus on God. Um, as people of God, we have to, when we go through trials, understand that that is a way that God strengthens us, as Mike was talking about, and we learn to trust in Him. Uh, we have to depend on Him for all things. So, What's the end? Question number five is, what is the end purpose of God's dealings with His people? Okay, to bless us. To abundantly bless us. In verse 10 He says, When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which He has given you. Our moral purpose is to glorify God. Uh, yes, he has a place waiting for us, so that's you know our reward. But we seek to glorify him, so we can do that more easily, perhaps, when he abundantly blesses us. But even when we don't have certain things that we think we need or have or want, we should still be striving to glorify God. But I think these what Moses is teaching them here is God's giving you all these things so that you can. Yes, He is going to bless us who are faithful and we are to turn around and bless Him. Now, again, Israel is looking a lot at what He's explaining here is this material blessing that He's going to give to them if they are faithful as a people, as a nation. And the same is true that this nation would prosper even more than what we have if we were faithful to God. The sin destroys things. But in verse 14 it says, When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He's warning them here, you go in, you, you receive all these blessings, be very careful about what that does to you. And making you think, well it's all on me. It, it's, it's something that I have done. Verse 17, Then you shall say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And so we have to be careful the blessings that we have that they don't blind us or cause us to forget about our dependency upon and our relationship to God. Any other thoughts there? Alright, we'll wrap it up there. And press on, Lord willing, next week.